something in my eye. Here, let me see. Yeah, it looks really irritated. So red. What happened? Oh, what's that? Oh. Uh, uh, oh, I, I, I thought I saw a rat. A rat? Probably nothing. Tomorrow I'm going to call the exterminator. Ow! Ow, chicka wow wow, chicka wow wow. What? what? What's your name and badge number? Look, they're hurting an old man, a Canadian citizen. It's communism. This is communism. He's scared. Communist. Call your police chief. He'll back you up. Call the police. Call your police chief. Arrested an old man. Shame on you. Shame on you. And it makes a big difference to tell the American people the truth about what our options are in ending this war. If tomorrow the order goes out from the president, I'm president of the United States, I issue an order, end the war today, begin to withdraw all American troops. It will take a year to get the American troops out. You hear me now? That's the truth. It will take a year to get them physically out. Now, if you leave all the equipment behind, you might be able to do it in seven months. And you leave those billions of dollars of weapons behind, I promise they're going to be used against your grandchild and mine someday. As you were leaving for your overseas trip, there were reports that were surfacing that your administration is planning to pay illegal immigrants who are separated from their families at the border up to $450,000 each, possibly a million dollars per family. Do you think that that might incentivize more people to come over illegally? If you guys keep sending that garbage out, yeah, but it's not true. So this is a garbage report? Yeah. Okay. So $450,000 dollars per person. Is that what you're saying? That was separated from a family member at the border under, under the last administration. That's not going to happen. Okay. Sending that garbage out, yeah, but it's not true. So this is a garbage report? Yeah. The president is perfectly comfortable with the Department of Justice settling with the individuals and families who are currently in litigation with the U.S. government. I would, in fact, make sure that there is, we immediately surge to the border. The country that is a first world democracy where they have the greatest disparity in wealth. It's one of the wealthiest countries in the hemisphere. And because of a corrupt system, that exists in Mexico. There is the one percent of the population at the top, a very small middle class, and the rest is abject poverty. Folks, I voted for a fence. I voted like unlike most Democrats, and some of you won't like it. I voted for 700 mile fence. But let me tell you, we can build a fence 40 stories high unless you change the dynamic in Mexico, and, and, you will not like this, and punish American employers who knowingly violate the law when, in fact, they hire illegals. An unrelenting stream of immigration, nonstop, nonstop, fewer than 50% of the people in America, from then and on, will be white European stock. That's not a bad thing. It's not going to stop. 
nor should we want it to stop. As a matter of fact, uh, um, it's one of the things I think we can be most proud of. I would, in fact, make sure that there is, we immediately surge to the border. We're building a beautiful wall, a big one that really works, that you can't get over, you can't get under. All the things that the pandemic, the schools closing, growing divisions in our communities. But they were hopeful too. They told me that they had faith in Joe Biden, that he could change the course of this country so we could breathe again. Gotta love democracy. <laughs> I tell you what, I would like to learn it. Let's do that, they'll come again. Do you have any reaction to the court's decision dropping the charges against former President Mubarak? Well, generally, uh, we continue to believe that uh, upholding impartial standards of accountability will advance the political consensus on which Egypt's long-term stability and economic growth depends. But beyond that, I would refer you to the Egyptian government for any further comment. So you don't so, criticize at all? What, so, what does that mean? It means that in general, we believe <laughs> that courts should be... It sounds to me like it means nothing. Be, in general, we believe that uh, impartial standards and the justice system should work as planned. Yeah. But I don't have any specific comment. But, 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 but did... I, I don't have any more specifics on But I, 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 I... Wow. I don't understand that at all. What, what does that mean? You, you believe it? Of course you do. But was that what, were those standards upheld in this case? I don't have anything, any specific comment on the case. I'd point can you to the Egyptian government. Can, can, can you see if... The, can, can we ask for... Uh, Push, push your people a little bit hard, harder because, I mean, you, you call for accountability and transparency all, all the time from all, any number of governments. And, and, and so if, if no one is held to account, if no one is being held accountable for, you know, for, for what happened, it would seem to me that you would have a problem with that. And if there's more we have to say, Matt, we will make sure you all know. But, I mean, what you have said, that, the, what you said says nothing. I mean, it just uh, it's like saying, well, we, we support the right of people to breathe. Well, if that's we great. Have a but if further comments on the case, I will make sure all of you have it. Okay. Uh, Aren't you a little bit annoyed that the, the person who was elected by the Egyptian people, Mercy, is languishing in prison while the person who was accused of murdering hundreds of people is actually out? On I appreciate innocent? your efforts, I mean, Saeed. I don't have anything no, further on this I, case. Saeed, I'm sorry. We're gonna we're gonna have to okay, move on. Sure. Thank, you. Thank you, everyone. That Egypt one is ridiculous. <laughs>
Let's go over the facts. Let's be clear about the facts. In the indictment, Durham says on September 19th, 2016, Sussman, who is on the payroll of the Clinton campaign and is billing them for his work on a, 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 literally in the billing, saying I'm working on the Russian bank issue. Sussman meets with the FBI general counsel, James Baker, and says, I have a tip. <laughs> and then tells him, I don't have a client involved in this. Well, he's billing the campaign for working on the Russia bank issue, which is what he's ta giving the tip about. And then on February 9th of 2017, after she's lost, he's still getting paid. He provides an updated set of allegations to a second government agency, one of the intelligence agencies, and again says, no client. Now, imagine what would have happened on September, in September of 2016, if he'd walked in and said, you know what, I've got some information. It's been collected by me, being paid by the Clinton campaign, and I'm working with a tech company and an outside investigation firm that's working on behalf of the Clinton campaign, but we're hiding the money so it doesn't show up on the Federal <laughs> Election Commission report. But I'm working on behalf of the Clinton campaign, and Donald Trump is in touch with a bank in Moscow. Do you think the FBI would have wasted one <laughs> minute on it? Of course no, not. that's why he lied. He lied then, he lied again in, in, in 2017, and he is now been caught and one of the key things that is going to is going to in my opinion convict this guy is that he has billing records to the Clinton campaign saying I'm working on the the, the Russian bank issue yeah. uh, pay me more money been doing this a long time but here's the way to look at it if car prices are too high right now there are two solutions you increase the supply of cars by making more of them or you reduce demand for cars by making America's poor. Cars by making America's poor. That's the choice. Resist much, obey little. Once unquestioning obedience, once fully enslaved. Once fully enslaved, no nation, state, city of this earth ever afterward resumes its liberty. These were the words of caution which the great poet Walter Whitman offered to his fellow Americans. For Whitman recognized that crucial to a free and flourishing society are men and women who are willing to question and even resist authority when necessary. But today, very few of us live by the ideal espoused by Whitman. Rather, blind obedience is the norm. We have become populations of sheep, easily to be herded into the chains of tyranny. But what has led those of us in the West to largely shun the advice of Whitman? In this video, we will examine two institutions that have played an integral role in the breeding of a passive citizenry, the compulsory state-run education system, which in North America is called the public school system, and the mainstream media. Public schooling is viewed as one of the shining lights of the modern Western world. Who could question the value of an institution that provides free and compulsory education for all? But as with many institutions of our day, the textbook picture of how the institution should work greatly diverges from the reality of how it does work. If public schools taught individuals how to think, if they promoted intellectual curiosity and produced citizens healthy in body and mind, then few would question their value. But beneath the veneer presented by the bureaucrats that run this institution, a darker reality emerges. Or as John Taylor Gatto, a former teacher turned one of public schooling's greatest critics, writes, Schools are intended to produce formulaic human beings whose behavior can be predicted and controlled. To a very great extent schools succeed in doing this, 
but in a national order in which the only successful people are independent, self-reliant, confident, and individualistic, the products of schooling are irrelevant. Well-schooled people are irrelevant. They can sell film and razor blades, push paper and talk on telephones, or sit mindlessly before a flickering computer terminal. But as human beings they are useless. Useless to others and useless to themselves. Noam Chomsky echoed this sentiment, writing in his book Understanding Power, Given the external power structure of the society in which they function, the institutional role of the schools, for the most part, is just to train people for obedience and conformity, and to make them controllable and indoctrinated. To some this may sound like heresy, but a study of history reveals that this was the intention from the very start. The state-run school systems in the West were modeled off the factory style of education first introduced in Prussia in the early 1700s. What shocks, writes Gatto, is that we should so eagerly have adopted one of the very worst aspects of Prussian culture, an educational system deliberately designed to produce mediocre intellects, to hamstring the inner life, to deny students appreciable leadership skills, and to ensure docile and incomplete citizens, all in order to render the populace manageable. Albert Einstein, an individual who reached heights of genius rarely seen, did not credit his compulsory schooling with his intellectual development. Reflecting back on his school years, Einstein noted that after completing his final examinations, his interest in the field he would go on to revolutionize was all but dead. I found the consideration of scientific problems he wrote distasteful to me for an entire year. Einstein believed that one of the major flaws of compulsory, state-run education systems is their forced style of teaching. It is, in fact, nothing short of a miracle, he wrote, that the modern methods of instruction have not yet entirely strangled the holy curiosity of inquiry. It is a very grave mistake to think that the enjoyment of seeing and searching can be promoted by means of coercion and a sense of duty. After well over a decade of indoctrination in the school system, few emerge with a great thirst for knowledge and a curiosity toward the many mysteries of the world. Instead, as Bruce Levine writes in his book Resisting Illegitimate Authority, by the time a student graduates they have been bred to be passive, to be directed by others, to take seriously the rewards and punishments of authority, to pretend to care about things that they do not care about, and that one is impotent to change one's dissatisfying situation. But if our schooling cannot be relied upon to generate the critical and curious minds needed to protect a society from the actions of corrupted authorities, can the mainstream media play this role? While there has been an increasing skepticism toward this institution in recent years, distaste and distrust toward the mainstream media has a long history. I have given up newspapers, wrote Thomas Jefferson, in exchange for Tacitus and Thucydides, for Newton and Euclid, and I find myself much the happier. Nietzsche, one of the most intellectually free and curious minds of history, was also no fan of the mainstream media. Sick are they always. They vomit their bile and call it a newspaper. We have all the while dove headlong into an illusory view of the world created by the mainstream media. His words are even more applicable today, where modern technology offers far better tools for the manipulation of the masses. The newspaper is a man-made cosmos of the world of events around us at the time. For the average reader, it is a construct with a set of significances which he no more thinks of examining than did his pious forebear of the 13th century think of questioning the cosmology. But why does the mainstream media so often choose deception over truth? Noam Chomsky in his book Media Control suggests that like many politicians, the mainstream media is dominated by individuals who adhere to an elitist ideology. The 20th century journalist Walter Lippmann epitomized this view, calling the masses the bewildered herd and suggesting that one of the main functions of the media is to put this herd in its proper place as passive spectators, not active participants, in the organization of a society. They spied on my campaign, no, There's Leslie. no e real evidence of that. Of course there is. No. It's all over the place. Leslie, Sir, they spied on my campaign and they got I, caught. Can I say something? You know, this is 60 Minutes. And we can't put on things we can't no, verify. you won't put it on because it's bad for Biden. And you know that, but you just don't want to no, put it on the air. No, as a matter of fact, I don't know that. Or as Chomsky explains, this elitist ideology is built on the notion 
that the mass of the public are just too stupid to be able to understand things. If they try to participate in managing their own affairs, they're just going to cause trouble. Therefore, it would be immoral and improper to permit them to do this. We have to tame the bewildered herd, not allow the bewildered herd to rage and trample and destroy things. For those of us who are not among the self-anointed elite, the question arises as to whether the controlling of the bewildered herd is done in order to promote a prosperous and flourishing society, or merely to maintain certain institutional structures which favor the elites to the detriment of society at large. This open question only reinforces the need for a more skeptical attitude toward the authority figures of our day. We need, in other words, more anti-authoritarians. It's painful. Is this a democracy? Is this Canada? Can you hear democracy, democracy's death now? It rings louder than the truckers' horns. The mainstream media has portrayed us as anti-government. I read that this morning on the mainstream media. Well, I've been pleading with the official Canadian government to talk and read our plan because the only plan that, that they have is violence. And the institution of a Chinese-style credit, social credit so score system, the entire, all of the members of parliament at the federal level should be ashamed of themselves. They have failed us badly. But instead, they're going to give themselves a third pay raise throughout this pandemic, while other people are going to lose everything. We have always been a peaceful protest. There has never been violence in the three weeks that I have been here. Just peace, love, hugs, and singing, O Canada. The violence came to us when the police arrived. The police brought the violence. Because from day one, the mainstream media has painted this as anti-government and some ridiculous comments about us wanting government change. Completely false. I've never sat in on a meeting with that as a, as a talking point. So I want to be very clear that our intent has always been, and always will be, to talk to the official government of Canada. I know how this will be spun, but I think people are smart enough to realize that uh, the, the preferred course of action from the government of Canada is violence over peace. It must be stressed that an anti-authoritarian is not someone who, in place of a passive acceptance of authority, adopts a passive rejection of all authority. Many institutions and authority figures serve a beneficial purpose and therefore should be accepted. But anti-authoritarians recognize that consensus does not mean truth, that power corrupts, that people lie, and that some institutions, in the words of Chomsky, have no moral justification. They are just there in order to preserve certain structures of power and domination. Recognizing these undeniable facts, the anti-authoritarian is willing to look at all authority figures with a healthy dose of skepticism, and potentially even resist their commands if such authority proves corrupt and harmful to the well-being of a society. Or as Henry David Thoreau wrote, If the machine of government is of such a nature that it requires you to be the agent of injustice to another, then, I say, break the law. But should we fear a world with more anti-authoritarians? The obedience bred into us in school, and the blind deference to authority promoted by the talking heads of the mainstream media, may lead some to view anti-authoritarians as a threat to the stability of society. But nothing could be further from the truth. Some of the organizers of this protest, which, as I mentioned, started more than a week ago, they do want to overthrow the government. Canadian officials calling the situation a, quote, nationwide insurrection. The police chief says COVID protests are a, quote, nationwide insurrection driven by madness. A nationwide insurrection 
driven by madness. I and mean, just think of the language. I know it sounds familiar to you, right? A threat to democracy, uh, an insurrection, sedition. The police say that they are under-resourced and they are overwhelmed. They have said that this city is under siege. It's not just truckers. There's a lot of, I, I, I've heard there's QAnon supporters in the crowd. Residents that I have spoken to who say they feel terrorized, intimidated. It's a cult. <laughs> Anti-authoritarians are the crucial protectors of a flourishing society, for as the author C.P. Snow noted, When you think of the long and gloomy history of man, you will find more hideous crimes have been committed in the name of obedience than have ever been committed in the name of rebellion. Malevolent authority, combined with a passive citizenry, is the recipe for tyranny, and so anti-authoritarians should not be feared or ostracized. They should be welcomed. They are the individuals who raise the alarm and awaken the slumbering masses to the existence of corrupt authority. A society without a healthy number of anti-authoritarians, or a society in which anti-authoritarians are shunned and silenced, is a society that has chosen the comfort of illusions over the desire for truth, and is therefore a society paving the way for its own destruction. Or as the 18th century French philosopher Voltaire cautioned, so long as the people do not care to exercise their freedom, those who wish to tyrannize will do so. For tyrants are active and ardent, and will devote themselves in the name of any number of gods, religious or otherwise, to put shackles upon sleeping men. By making America's poor. By making America's poor. That's a choice. Thanks, Jen. Um, I just want to follow up on, on the supply chain that you just said was, uh, you were seeing some serious progress on that front. So a couple of questions yeah. um, there. So the Port of Long Beach yesterday saw this new record broken, 100 vessels that anchor are waiting to enter normally pre-COVID. They're seeing 17 ships, uh, give or take, an anchor. Is the president satisfied today on where things stand? The president is satisfied that progress continues to be made. And one of the reasons that uh, there has been uh, so much traffic uh, in a lot of these ports is because there are more goods that are being ordered by people across the country. People have more uh, money, expendable resources. Uh, their wages are up. More people are working than they were a year ago. It was, it was crystal clear that things were not improving on supply chain. People couldn't get dishwashers and furniture and treadmills delivered on time, not to mention all sorts of other things. Inflation, you moron! Nobody has extra money? Why the tragedy of the short, the treadmill that's delayed. Right, the treadmill. Uh, th thank you. I wanted to ask about the proof of vaccination certificates as well. Um, it seems like a lot of businesses are kind of caught in a, in a weird dilemma because you've given them the ability to continue on with the proof of vaccination certificates if they choose to. So uh, for a business owner, if they remove the proof of vaccination, they may lose business because people might feel unsure, uncertain about, you know, dining in a restaurant with unvaccinated people. However, though, they, they may also face targeted harassment if they keep up with the proof of vaccination. What's, what's your suggestion for what a business owner in that situation should do? I think, I think the market's going to dictate, you know, you, you, can go to, you can go to Costco, you can go to Walmart, you can go shopping. You know, you don't know if the person has a shot beside you or not, but we also know that it doesn't matter if you have one shot or ten shots, you can catch COVID. Colin, we can't stay in this position forever. we got to learn to live with this and get on with our lives. I bet if I asked every single person in this room, do you want these damn masks or do you want them off? They want them off. They want to get back to normal. They want to be able to go for dinner with their families. This is about, again, their democracy and freedoms. And liberties, and I, I hate as a government telling anyone what to do. We just got to get moving forward and, and get out of this and protect the jobs. You know, we're, I think a lot of people call them, probably yourself too, everyone's done with us. Like, we are done with it. So let's, let's start moving on and cautiously. And, you know, we, we've, we've followed the rules, all of us, like 90% of us, for, for over two years. The world's done with it. So let's just move forward. Rock and I think it's a right for people to have bad and kept care. For people to have bad and kept care. My son's business dealings were not anything with everybody that he's talking about. I'll lead an effective strategy to mobilize true and international suffered to pressure. True and international suffered to pressure. True and international suffered to pressure. We've now hit 
Nine million cases nationwide. You know how I know how hard it is. Look, tomorrow is Super Thursday, Tuesday, and I want to thank you all. I tell you what, I'm rushing ahead, aren't I? We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men and women created by the go, you know the you know the thing. I watched what happened when the kids from Parkland marched up to and I I, I I met with them and then they went off to up on the hill when I was vice president, they went off the hill to go into those neighborhoods. All those congressmen were like, No, I'm not here, I'm not here. I, I'm not, don't, don't tell them I'm around. We are. We choose unity over division. We choose science over fiction. We choose truth over facts. Words that stun the nation, and I would argue, I know, shocked the world. International leaders spoke about it. You had people like Margaret Thatcher, uh, excuse me, you had p p people like the, the former chairman and leader of the party in, in Germany. You had Angela Merkel. We have this notion that somehow if you're poor, you cannot do it. Poor kids are just as bright and just as talented as white kids, wealthy kids, black kids, Asian kids. You cannot do it. Poor kids are just as bright and just as talented as white kids, wealthy kids, black kids, Asian kids. I never believed we'd have to fight this hard, though. I never believed it would be this much in jeopardy. We launched our campaign over on the Oval back in 29, May 9th. 2019. But you know, what I said then, we've been through a lot since then. But what I said then is even more true today. COVID has taken this year, just since the outbreak, has taken more than 100 years. Look, here's the lives. It's just, it's a, when you think about it. I come out of the black community in terms of my support. If you notice, I have more people supporting me in the black community that have announced for me. The only African-American woman that ever been elected to the United States Senate. A whole range of people. No, My point no, is, that's not true. The other that's one not is true. here. <laughs> I said the first. Thank I said the first African-American elected. The first African-American. And we're going to create a new bio-based multi-manufacturing multi job. Uh, uh, environment to deal farmers in on the benefits of a changing economy. One of the things that that uh, um, that, the, that the leader of the United States Senate, the Speaker, I mean the House, the Speaker of the House, you got more questions, but I tell you, if you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Trump, then you ain't black. <laughs> something in my eye. Here, let me see. Yeah, it looks really irritated. So red. What happened? Oh, what's that? Oh, uh, oh. Uh, oh I, I, I thought I saw a rat. A rat? Probably nothing. Tomorrow I'm going to call the exterminator. Ow! Wow, chicka wow wow, chicka wow wow. What? what? Thank you.